Well, I'll say bless the Lord if you'll say, oh, my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Hi, Kairos and Chris. I'm the pastor here. It's good to be back with you guys. Um, thanks for letting me be out last week. Originally, it was for a uh, staff retreat, but we had a uh, death in the family, so I got to go be present and do a funeral, um, which was a, just a great celebration of life and to be able to help steward some of my family's grief. Um, but Bishop Walker, Joseph Walker III, got to come here, um, and it was outstanding and amazing, and we love the partnership that we have uh, with their church. And this Sunday, past Sunday night, we got to go to Mount Zion Baptist, and we got to do a unity worship service, and it was delightful, it was substantial, and it was prophetic about what God is wanting to do in the hearts and lives of his people and bringing us together. And I still, I can't get over it. I, uh, yes, amazing. And so I'm asking for more of that, Lord. Just a clear turn signal, if you're the type of person who is not comfortable crossing cultures and being around people who don't like you, uh, you're going to be increasingly uncomfortable with the direction of this church and ministry. So that's just fair warning. Um, we want to be an incredibly, wonderfully diversified group of believers who are united under the banner of Jesus Christ. That relationship's going so well. They've just invited us to their night of worship for their young adults ministry. So check us out on social media. I'll give you updates as we get the dates for that. But I would love for us to be able to worship in their space um, and in their hospitality. So uh, super excited about that. We're um, in the middle of a series called uh, Things You Don't Need to Pray About. Wah, wah. Um, that comes from A.W. Tozer who said this, prayer is never a substitute for for obedience. That's an attack kind of on religious Christianese that when someone asks us something, you'll say, yeah, I'll pray about it, and we really are not going to pray about it. And there are just some basic things, as Christ followers, we're called to do. Like, you don't really need to pray about it. You need to do it. Now, yes, you need to pray about the why, the how, and the when, and learn how to understand the Holy Spirit's promptings, but as far as the what goes, yes, you need to step into that. Absolutely. So, sharing our faith. I just wonder if I'm, I should share my faith. Yes, you should. Congratulations. Now let's just figure out how to do the what, or the, the when, the how, and the why. Tonight, I want to talk to you about generosity. You don't need to pray about it. You are someone who, while you are a sinner, Christ died for you, and you have everything you need given by a gracious Father in heaven that you need to live a life of godliness, and he's calling you to be a conduit of his freedom, his grace, his mercy, his power, and his resources. You don't need to pray about giving. You need to give. Now, again, I understand how that hits you guys. Here's what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about tithing. I'm not going to talk about the generational problem that millennials love to give to causes but don't want to give to the institutional church. Not going to talk about that because the second I start talking about it, you know that the reason that I go home and have food on my table is because people tithe to this church. So you won't hear it from me. So I would encourage you, if that's something you're struggling through, I could break down all the Old Testament theology and New Testament theology. And believe me, you'd rather have Old Testament theology on giving than New Testament, all right? on how we give, why we give, and why, why that needs to happen. I just encourage you, if you're in a group of people that you trust, just go, hey, how have you worked it out between you and God, your intentional giving to the kingdom of God? And start asking questions, talk about your reservations, talk about your skepticism. I encourage those conversations. You want to talk to me about it, I'd love to chat with you. I've had some of those same reservations and questions and had to work those out in, a, in through my series of faith. But tonight... Uh, I just want to tell you some key moments in scripture and in my life that the Lord just unleashed for me and demonstrated his overwhelming goodness and generosity and how much more I desire to live in that space and how much I am consistently aware of the greedy little miser that lives in me who longs and lusts after shiny things to hoard so that I feel better about myself and you think more of me than I should. So that's where we're headed. Uh, the phrase that I love uh, that comes from Winston Churchill that will help maybe guide some of our conversation tonight is, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. 
And the spiritual temperature in this room, I think a lot of us are full of anxiety and fear and tension and workaholism because we're so obsessed with getting a living that we're missing out on the abundant life that God is offering us right here, right now, especially in the midst of your neediness. Again, with our demographic, I don't know about you, but um, uh, when I first got married, we were... uh, probably about a thousand dollars above the poverty line and we probably sat there for a good 10 years and that's okay Uh, Lord taught us a lot through that and it was an incredible time and a very difficult time but anytime I would hear a talk about giving or generosity I would go not for me not yet yeah that's great I I can barely pay the electric bill Um, I'm in the student loan debt up my eyeballs Uh, that, that doesn't apply to me that applies to other rich people Okay, and I would go, that's for me one day, one time when I actually finally have income and can get at a place where I can afford to give. Let's just put this in perspective real quickly. Here's some global stats. I borrowed these from Chris White when he came and talked with us. Um, If you were to reduce the entire world's population, global population, to 100 people, here's some of the interesting demographics. Can we put that up on the screen? First of all, this is how the ethnicity would break down. If the whole world population was 100 people, that's what it would look like. Now I want to move a little bit on to what it would look like financially, all right? Six people in the global village of 100 people would possess 60% of all the wealth, and all six of them would be from the United States. 80 out of 100 people in the global population would live in substandard housing. 80 of your neighbors. 70 would be able to not be able to read. 50 would suffer from malnutrition, poverty, and starvation. And only one person would have a college education and one person would have access to a computer in the global village of 100. Let's push it just a little bit further. Here's some things to ponder. If you made $15,000 last year, you are in the top 20% of the world's income earners. This talk isn't for me. I'm not rich. If you have sufficient food, decent clothes, live in a house or apartment, and have a reasonably reliable means of transportation, you are among the top 15% of the world's wealthy. In the entire world. If you've got $2,200 in this world, you're rich. Assets, not cash, but you accumulate all of your possessions together and it totals more than $2,200. You are an adult person at the top of the 50th percent of the world's wealthiest. I'd probably take your phone and your computer and congratulations, you're in half of the richest world of people, right? If you have food in the refrigerator, clothes in a closet, a roof over a head, a place to sleep, you are richer than 95% of this world. If you have an income over $50,000, you're the top 1%. This talk is for us. This talk is for us to elevate our worldview and our perspective and realize that God has entrusted some of the largest amounts of the world's resources to us to advance his kingdom, not ours. And some of us need to realize that in our spirit, we have turned into a Grinch who just wants to be the martyr, afflicted, and constantly be reminded of what we don't have rather than appreciative of what we do have. And we need a measure of God's grace to bring to us what Scripture says. There is great benefit with godliness and contentment. So that's why we're going to talk about giving. Um, We'll be in Exodus chapter 36, and we're going to read verses 2 through 7. And this is this wonderful, delightful story of God's people after he set them free from slavery, from Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness trying to find their homeland, and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we play, have a place where God can meet us and we can worship him and we can be reminded that he's the giver of every good gift. And so to set up this text... Um, Exodus 35, verse 4, Moses says to the community, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts 
Present the following gifts to the Lord. And he gives out a list. And so here's what is going to come next. Let me pray for us before we read this text. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Exodus 36, starting in verse 2. Moses summoned Bielza and Orhalabib. I don't know, but I just committed. And all the others who were specifically gifted by the Lord were eager to get to work. Gosh, I love that phrase. Do you realize you're specifically gifted to the Lord and I want people who are eager to work? Uh, Moses gave the materials donated by the people of Israel as sanctuary offerings for the completion of the sanctuary. But the people continued to bring additional gifts each morning. Finally, the craftsmen who were working on the sanctuary left their work and went to the Moses and they said, they're giving too much. The people have given more than enough materials to complete the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. As one translation says, tell them to stop, they've given too much. So Moses gave the command in this message and he sent it throughout the whole camp. Men and women, do not prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred gifts and offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of a church where you have a building campaign and uh, the pastor gets up and goes, stop. We have more than enough money. We need no more. It's too much. Keep it. Have you ever been part of a giving experiment to someone who with tears running down their eyes looked at you and said, stop, you've just given too much. This should be part of the rhythm of the people of God who understand we've been freely given everything so we could freely give it away. Oh, I just wonder what happens when we understand our true sonship and daughtership and we get rid of this mentality of scarcity and start to embrace the kingdom mindset of abundancy that he has everything that I need waiting in the wings to be released once I've proven myself trustworthy as a steward of his resources. I love what uh, Leander Keck, he's a professor of theology at Harvard Divinity School, says about this text. God will only be adequately housed when his people give generously and abundantly. Wait for it. Their sacrificial giving creates a habitat for his holiness. How big is the house for God's holiness are you currently creating through your sacrificial giving? I just don't know if I'm experiencing God. I just don't really feel his presence. Maybe it's because you built him this tiny, tiny, small room through your sacrificial giving. And your capacity for giving is so thin because you never learned how to receive in the first place. And you've been deluded into thinking that what you own is actually mine. And I deserve it. And no one else needs to get their hands on it. And don't forget, man, I struggle with that when I was in my 20s and 30s, and now it's just reimagined itself for my kids. Like, I think, oh, I've got to provide, I've got to protect, I've got to make sure they have all this stuff, and they've got to make sure and ensure their futures. It's not my job to provide for my kids. That's God's job. It's my job to steward his resources. I've got to remind myself of that every day, or else I become controlling, doubtful, and I spend time spinning out worst-case scenarios. Uh, all right, I'm trying to think what, what I want to share with you. All right, so here's how it worked in my life. One, um, with all of the fractured relationships I had with my dad and his inability to be able to give affection and affirmation, um, he was a generous guy. He was incredibly generous with the stuff that he had. So much so, sometimes it actually made me mad. Like I was a spoiled little kid. Like, why are you giving away your resources to that person? Hello? Um, I'm glad my wife's not here tonight. She's hanging out with my daughters. Simon, you're here, but don't tell mom I told this story. Before Audrey, I brought home a girl who there was potential with, okay? And 
she was putting herself through nursing school. She had a single parent home. And when my parents met her, my dad was so impressed, like looking at me, this spoiled little kid who he spent five years of college trying to get through. And here's this girl who's supporting herself, working two jobs, trying to get a nursing degree and better herself. He just said afterwards, Chris, I feel like the Lord told me we need to support her. I'm like, hot dog, that makes me look great. Thanks, Dad. She dumps me a month later. I'm heartbroken. And come to find out, they're still supporting her. <laughs> Dad, what are you doing? You know what she did to me? <laughs> Christopher, I just felt like the Lord told us we needed to provide for her. Hey. Like, where does that come from? Like, he it, it, it would just give abundantly and generously and liberally. And it's one of the things that I would love to think that I inherited from him. Um, I was in school, uh, South Florida, year three, saved up my entire time. I had this idealized version that if I could be a South Florida guy driving a Jeep to the beach, I would have arrived. And finally, I got one. It was a 1987 CJ7. It's a piece of junk, but man, when it ran, I was cool. Um, and so that helped fill all my deep insecurities, and I thought I had finally just arrived, and then the Lord starts getting a hold of my heart. I have an opportunity to do camp and go on a missions trip, and you've got to raise $3,000. And the Lord just kind of taps me on the shoulder and says, you're going to sell your Jeep. How much do you love me? You're going to learn how to give sacrificially. You're not just going to ask other people to give. You're going to give too, and you're going to give the thing that your heart's been coveting the most. And I said, <laughs> that's not you, Lord, that's Satan. I know you want. <laughs> we worked so hard for that. But I've been using it for your kingdom. Really my kingdom, but <laughs> anyway. So I may, this is, you got to understand, for, for me, this is, it sounds silly now, but it was a huge faith-building moment. God met me where I was at. And he knew my little pet idols. And he knew he was going to prompt me and prove to me for a career that I had no idea in ministry that he would always be faithful. And so I had just made the determination that I was going to sell it. Hadn't even put it out to sell it yet. Uh, Danny Goodman, who is one of my mentors and spiritual fathers who opened up scripture to me at that time, we were hanging out at his house. I drove the Jeep over to his house um, and I pull up and he's got a little CRX. Do you know what those are? Honda CRXs, little itty bitty go-karts. I used to call it the CR excrement. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, was, it was beat up. It was janky or whatever. I said, dude, you have a CRX? He's like, yeah, absolutely. I said, oh, cool, man. If you ever want to sell it, let me know. I'm getting ready to sell my Jeep. When I get back from a missions trip, I'll need another car. He goes, oh, you can have it. Excuse me? Yeah, someone gave me that. You can have it. I, I had never been around someone who lived so freely in the kingdom that way. Like, it wasn't even a thought. Like, he didn't pray about it. It was just a... He was, yeah, someone gave it to me, it's yours. Before I mean, even put my offering on the altar, God already had one waiting for me to build my trust and my faith, however small and feeble it was. Then I get on that mission trip, we're over in Switzerland doing a, a camp for uh, missionary kids. And there's this little kid, I don't remember his name, is Kieran, maybe I'm just making that up, but he was Scottish. And Braveheart was popular at the time, and I spoke in a Scottish accent the whole week just because I thought it was cool. Hi, Karen. Oh, you have the look of your father, right? <laughs> Loving on this kit was great. And we decided it's going to be one, a great idea to go up to the top of the Swiss Alps and have a worship service. It's July, but it's freezing up there. So we go up there, and what I didn't realize is, hey, when you make sacrifices for God to put you in the center of his kingdom, you think the first one is the last one? No, he's just proxy bidding you. He's like, oh, there's going to be some more, because I'm going to keep on building your faith. And so I had a picture. I couldn't find it in my photo album today, but it's burnt in my memory because someone took a picture of it. We get up there. We're standing. We're worshiping. It's freezing cold, and I had on my Timberland windbreaker. Timberland, man. It was so sweet. I knew I was going to be traveling. I knew I needed a good one. I don't need water resistance. I need waterproof, okay? You guys, if you ever had a windbreaker that's water resistant, it sucks when it rains, okay? When it's waterproof, you're dry and happy and self-righteous. And so I had that bad boy on, and we're all freezing, and it's kind of like raining and snowing, and he's shivering. And um, I'm like, oh, my gosh, buddy, are you cold? He's like, yeah. So I take the jacket off. I put it around him and put an arm around them. And I have my arm around them while we're in the middle of the worship service. And 
And I don't know how to hear the Holy Spirit's voice back then, but I feel this prompting. Give that boy your jacket. And I said, no. No. <laughs> a, a, a freaking jacket. <laughs> the Lord's prompted me to give, and I'm too selfish because I have a Timberland Ray jacket that I want to keep. And so we got down to the bottom of the mountain, and I, I said, buddy, you good? He's like, yeah, here's your jacket back. I said, thank you. I packed it up, lost it the next week. And in that moment, I thought, never again will I miss one of those moments. While the Lord has trusted me with something and given me the ability to give something, I'm not letting it pass me by. Because it's all temporary, and it's all just junk at the end of the day. But I want to be available and ready to be a conduit of God's grace and his goodness, no matter how limited or excessive my resources are. Plus, there's some of us, man, when we get to giving, we're great at giving out of our abundance, but very few of us are good at giving out of our poverty. Do you remember that story, right? That Jesus sees the widow who puts in just a little mite. He says her gift is greater than anybody's. And we're like, what are you talking about? That's like the lowest gift. No, she's given out of her poverty. Everyone else is given out of their riches. So my question for you tonight is, where is God calling you to sacrificial giving out of your poverty? Sometimes it's our finances. Sometimes it's our time. Sometimes it's affirmation and affection. Not really good at that. Well, maybe that's what the Lord's calling. Maybe it's just patience. I'm asking you to give patience to someone. Ah, I just really don't have that. Well, then give out of your poverty and watch me multiply it in the kingdom of God. Uh, after Audrey and I got married, uh, we got so many gifts. It was one of those, stop, you've given too much. And then to be honest with you, it's like, stop, you've given us too much stuff we'll never use. And this was, this was back before I submitted to my wife and all things in the household. But I'm like, why do we have three sets of china? This is so stupid. Like, now we're buying furniture to house plates that we'll never use. Again, Simon, let's not tell mom any of this stuff. It's a good thing she doesn't listen to me. Um, but we literally had a closet in our first apartment where we stuck all the duplicates. Now, I know what you guys do. You take the receipts and go back and get the money for them and spend it on stuff you want. That's fine, sinners, pagans. You're good to do whatever you want. I'm 10 times more righteous than you. We created the closet of gifts. So we're poor. We don't have any money. But anytime it was a birthday or Christmas, we would go into the closet of gifts and go shopping. It was great, especially for, like, our grandparents, right? It's Christmas. Oh, Gigi needs a carafe. What the tar is a carafe and why do we use them? I don't care. Send it to her. Uh, oh, my mom needs something for her birthday. Here's some crystal salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> then, you know, we had probably like nine George Foreman grills that I gave to all my buddies. Uh, we were the most generous people you could meet for about a year and a half until we went bankrupt in our closet of gifts. Was that giving sacrificially? Yeah. It was giving out of my abundance, right? Not out of my poverty. And then when it came down to actually truly giving the sacrifice, that's where the real test starts to come. Some of you all are just giving out of your abundance of your closet of gifts. David in the psalmist, when he's getting ready to build the temple for the Lord, is getting a piece of land. And someone says, hey, I want to donate this to you. And he says, oh, no, I'll pay you fair price. How would I ever sacrifice to the Lord something that costs me nothing? Here's what I honestly believe. This week, God's going to test you to see if you are a trustworthy steward of his resources. He's going to put you in front of a need that he specifically designed you to meet. And chances are it's going to come out of your poverty. And he's going to go, will they be faithful? And can I trust them with even more resources? Because here's what our father doesn't want us to do. Give us enough gifts to kill ourselves with. And this is not a condemnation about money. Money's tricky. I get it. Resources are tricky. I get it. And we've all agreed, I think, that we're some of the richest people speaking in the world. But here's a verse that I think is utterly delightful. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and trust their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives 
all we need for our enjoyment. This is not the talk, don't enjoy what you have, don't enjoy possessions. This is a talk, learn how to party in the kingdom of God. The reason some of you who are the richest in this room are the most miserable, you trust your wealth, not God. And even your giving is a form of bartering to deal with the guilt of your resources. Man, and I'll tell you what, some of my friends with resources who I watch are some of the biggest challenge of how they freely let resources go in and out of their hands. And sometimes I pray, Lord, bless them with more resources because they have proven themselves faithful in your kingdom. Lord knows he can't trust me with that much. Because then I start to get greedy. Then I'll just start buying stupid stuff. Lord, just give me as much as I can to be right where I am and build my faith to help steward more. But don't let me sabotage my own life with these things and possessions. It's good. It's fun. It's for enjoyment. But I'll tell you who I'm looking to a lot more these days. It's Jesus, who though he was poor, was rich, who freely received everything he had from the Father and equally distributed it out in generous, ridiculous acts. He had no problems receiving. Some lady took an entire years of her wages and anointed him with oil, and he said, stop, what she's doing is a good thing for me. He didn't say, oh, no, 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 I don't deserve this. No, 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 give that to someone else. He gave her the joy of giving. He also let women support him out of their own means as he traveled and did his ministry. But he also gave generously and abundantly. Man, he told stories about a son who went bankrupt his father and destroyed half of his wealth. And when he came home, he threw a party. That probably cost 10 times that. He took 150 gallons of water and turned it into wine so that the wedding could get even better because Jesus knows how to enjoy the gifts that God gives us. Then he takes this itty-bitty meal some kid who decides, let me give out of my poverty. There's no way what I have to offer could ever be of any significance to the kingdom, but let me put it in the hands of Jesus and see what happens. And 5,000 people went home with their bellies full with leftovers. What's that little lunch that you're clinging on to that the Lord says, place it in my hands. And not only will I multiply it, there'll be leftovers. And with those leftovers, you'll learn to trust me even more and more, and more. Amen? So let's take 120 seconds and just listen in and lean in. I got two questions for you during this time that we try to journal and listen to the Lord and process what we've heard and determine how we need to respond to God and his word. First question, is it, is it more difficult for you to give or more difficult for you to receive? Some of us, we got no problems giving, but our pride doesn't like for us to receive. We don't want to be needy. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be out of control. Some of us are great at receiving, but giving, ooh, that really just exposes our lack of trust, our greed, and our control issues. Which one's more difficult? And then I'd ask you to answer this. This can be in relationships, finances, opportunities, jobs, your whole life. Engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Where is God currently calling you to receive something that you are unwilling to receive? And where might be God be calling you to give something right now that you're hesitant to give? Where's God calling you to receive something that you're just going, no, that's not for me. I don't want it. I don't deserve it. I don't want to be seen as needy. Where is God calling you to sacrificially give that you're reluctant? Once you've identified those two areas, if you could just picture yourself as the little boy who swaddles up next to Jesus or one of his disciples and 
takes your little brown lunch bag and puts it in his hands. Let's listen together.